What the hell does this say? He held his wounded hand, still glowing, up to his mentor. The old man squinted and replied, It says, warning, this podcast contains horror fiction. Contents may disturb you. Pseudopod, Artemis Rising 4, episode 586 for March 16th, 2018. For Fear of Little Men by Sandra M. O'Dell. Hi everyone, I'm Alex West with Andrea Subasati, and we are the Faculty of Horror podcast from Toronto, Ontario. We are thrilled to be back hosting Artemis Rising. I think this is our third year in a row doing it. And we have a terrific story for you today. And the author of the story is Sandra M. O'Dell, who lives in Washington State with her husband, sons, and a grumpy orange cat. I like her already. Her work has appeared in such venues as Podcastle, Cast of Wonders, Crossed Genres, and Daily Science Fiction. Her last appearance here on Pseudopod was for last year's Artemis Rising event with her story Meet, narrated by Linda Hamilton. Her collection, Godfall and Other Stories, will be released next month. For Fear of Little Men is a Pseudopod original. Your narrator this week is Alistair Stewart. Al is the owner of Escape Artists and the host of Pseudopod. When he's not doing either of those things, he's professionally enthusiastic about genre fiction all over the place, like Tor.com, MCM Buzz, and Fox Spirit Books. At least for this week, his favorite episode of the Faculty of Horror is the one on Pontypool, but an argument can be made for the one on Rare Exports. Thanks, Al. Good choices. Now, we have a story for you, and we promise you it's true. For Fear of Little Men by Sandra M. O'Dell Narrated by Alistair Stewart Once upon a time, there was a boy named Dalton who longed to be a kobold and keep treasure in his stone shoes. That is, until one came to live under his bed, and he learned what horrid little creatures they truly were. The wicked thing smelled of licorice, and Mama's kisses when she went too long without brushing her dentures. It hobbled around in its stone clogs in the dark of night, knocking over books, tumbling shoes off the rack. "'There's a kobold living under my bed, Mama," he said when his mother came to see what the fuss was all about. "'I saw it with my torch. He pinched me here, and here, and even here. There will be none of that, young man,' Mama said as she tucked the brushed cotton quilt under his chin. "'You go to sleep this instant, and in the morning you will pick up your room or else.' That night... Alton realized Mamas did not know what it meant to have a kobold living under one's bed. The next night, Alton asked for an aspirin for his headache, then curled on his side with the quilt tucked under his chin and his toes safe and warm in wool socks. He waited, very still, very quiet. The house settled to sleep with creaks and pops and groans, what Aunt Bethany called night talk before she left without saying goodbye. No sooner had Papa begun to snore than Alton heard the clunk thump of uneven steps under the bed, the sound an ice hammer cracking up his spine. The moment the kobold crawled from under the bed and reached up to give him a pinch on the backside, he whipped over quick as he could and grabbed the miserable thing around the throat with both hands. The tiny hunchback was brittle leaves and chicken bones. Alton brought his thumbs together and squeezed until they met his fingers on the other side, a thrill of excitement shivering down his spine. The kobold's eyes bulged and its spindly neck snapped with a tinder crack. It twitched once, twice, and then sagged limp and still as a bag of rocks in Alton's hands. When he stopped shaking... Alton pulled up his socks and snuck downstairs for a knife to see if a kobold really was filled with rocks. It wasn't, and Mama walloped him good the next morning for making a sticky mess on the sheets. Only Alton knew where to look for the fae, some more fair than others, but all gimlet-eyed and not to be trusted. Hook-nosed gnomes in the grocer's bins, pixies peeking around the corners of pews, Mulchins under girls' skirts during school, tickling tender panty bits with sticky feathers until the girls squirmed in their seats on long, sunny days. No one believed him. No one ever believed him. 
So Alton taught himself in secret, late at night when no one was around. He read everything he could lay his hands on, paperbacks, encyclopedias, plays, TV listings, leprechauns, puka, the foul humoured fur darag with their backward hands and four-foot-long beards. He compared the satyrs of Greece to the fauns of the British Isles and wondered if the Kilyukai of Papua New Guinea were more or less common than Sprigash. No detail was too small to note in the pages of his ever-growing collection of carefully organised composition books. The depth of his studies left Alton with little time for extracurricular activities, and the expectations of others were constant impositions. A boy your age should be on the field, not behind the stacks, reading poetry, Papa said the day he signed Alton up for the local football league. Alton set down his cup of juice. I don't want to play football. Listen to your father, dear, Mama said, and set to organising the league carpool. The majority of Alton's schoolmates, they were equally understanding. Do all a girl... Brenton Payne said on the busy street corner, turning the composition book every which way. What's a duel a girl? Alton kept his voice low and reasonable as he could. Hands balled into fists at his sides. His head throbbed. Sweat ran down his collar, every breath heavy in the muggy afternoon heat. They had caught him on his way home from the library. He was more annoyed than angry with the three upperclassmen. The red caps leering from their jacket pockets, though, were another matter entirely. It's pronounced Dula Gal and is from Australia. I would like my book back now, Brenton. The rugby captain ham-handed his way through the pages. Is this what you're doing with your time in the library, Waddlemouth? Brenton's cohorts, Peter Willich and pig-eyed Alan Hembridge, snickered. Alton took a slow breath. I'm studying. That's all. I can do what I want with my time. Now, if you don't mind, I really do need my book. My parents are expecting me home in time for dinner. Brenton eyed Alton with the superiority of the popular. Are you a fairy, Waddlemouth? You a poo pirate? As much as you are said Alton, and as the colour of truth rushed up the other boy's cheeks, Alton dashed forward, snatched the precious black and white book, and bolted down the street. He made it halfway down the block before the others realised what was said and took off after him. He tore across the street and rounded a corner smoke shop, drivers standing on their horns and brakes. His heart pounded as he dashed around another corner in search of sanctuary from the inevitable. The composition book clutched to his chest, and then they were on him. Peter took him low, and Brenton came in high, slamming him to the walk as they pummeled and kicked and called him a miserable gay boy and fucking Paddy Puff and other things that hurt less than their fists. Three-on-one was a losing fight. Alton protected the book with his body and waited for the worst to be over. When an East Indian shopkeep finally chased off the dirty crows, Alton made it to his feet and gave the man a fake name and phone number to ring his parents. He limped off before the ruse was discovered. The memory of the Red Cap's maniac laughter grated like fingers down the chalkboard of Alton's soul. At home he complained of a sour stomach and went straight to his room. A grig was perched on his windowsill, twiggish, coy, singing to the coming night. Alton made it to the sill in two quick steps and slammed the window shut on the beastie's eggshell head. Quivering with warm release, he wiped up the mess with a handful of tissues and hid the refuse at the bottom of his waste can. Mama let him stay home from school for the rest of the week. For all his devoted scholarship, a book could not adequately detail the care needed to peel away the smooth birch bark of a hamadryad's face, or how it was best to pinch and give a sharp twist when tearing the wings from a sylph's back. Alton took prodigious notes. Upon completing his year thirteen, the young man collected his award from Mamer's meagre estate and spent a heady ten months on the continent, hunting and dissecting Fay before settling to university. He could have hoped the rush of exploration would survive the snobbery and intolerance of school, but hope, like nobility, shouldered a heavy burden. 
I wasn't stalking her. I was, I was, I was trying to help her. Alton said as he tromped down the library steps by following her home from the pub and waiting in the bushes for an eyeful through a bedroom window. Xavier gave back. Face it, Alton. You're not the type of fella that has a girl saying no and meaning yes. You're lucky she didn't press charges. Around the commons, the semester's cliques lounged in shady fellowship, beneath stout oaks and leafy elders, while the slow, spicy red of bossa nova music spilled from an open window like thick silk. Alton would have liked to find a bench in the sun where he could catch up on Nando Pagani's Magyar fairy tales from old Hungarian legends, but the inescapable fey presence curdled the moment and his mood. He hunched his shoulders. He kept his head down. Yeah. He realised after the fact that Xavier had asked a question. Um, c come again? Was this helping Megan anyway? Hey, let's get a quick nosh before class. They opted for curry noodles and a table in the sun. Alton sorted through varieties of the truth while he picked out the shredded carrots. Have you ever had the feeling you're being watched? Xavier glanced up from his plate. You mean like watched or watched watched? Alton sipped at his water. The latter, I suppose. Something like that, anyway. Not really. Why? Alton tipped his bottle in the direction of a hammer dryad, dozing in the comfortable embrace of her oaken self, the people around her none the wiser. Take a look over there and tell me what you see. A tree. And some people. What else? Um, Nina Dobson's talking on her cell. There's a packy with a throwing disc. Is this multiple choice? What about the tree? What about it? Is there anything different about it? Alton said carefully. Xavier took his time answering. Not that I can tell. It's an oak tree. It's big. It's woody. It's got leaves. What if I were to tell you that the tree is alive? Xavier snorted. I wouldn't call the times, that's for certain. Alton leaned across the table. I mean it, it's alive. Xavier rolled his eyes. So it's alive. What's that have to do with being watched? Because it's the tree that's watching. Something inside the tree. Part of the tree, actually. Xavier dropped his voice as he cut a look at the crowd once more. You mean like a camera? Alton sat back, a familiar headache, picking at the tender spot between his eyes with a thin, black claw. No, no, not a camera. A hammer dryad. It's, um, it's a fay. Of a sort. Xavier shook his head and laughed. <laughs> You're mental. <sighs> we went from your skulking after Megan to being watched to naff and fairies. It all makes sense if you think about it. Hear me out, Zav. I'm not so mental as that. I wasn't stalking Megan, I swear. I thought she was in trouble for my gankanach. Xavier rubbed his teeth with a crumbled napkin. Never heard of him. Alton's fork kept on conscious time with the black claw, tearing tiny holes in the waxed paper plate. Not a him, not directly. A gankanach is an it that looks like a him. It's a fay from Ireland. They're known for taking a fancy to a woman, having a go with her, and then leaving her so desperate for more that she pines away until she dies. He looked for a glimmer of understanding in Xavier's uneducated scepticism and continued. I can't really say how it managed its way to campus, but I knew that if the Gankanach got its leg over with Megan, she was as good as dead. The memory of the slender, foppish fay was as vivid in daylight as the reality had been three nights ago outside Megan Holmes' flat. Lucky for her, Alton had been nearby to scare the wretched thing away. He'd kept watch at Megan's window the rest of the night in case it returned. Xavier folded his empty plate around his fork. What was the hammer dryad thing he doing? Nothing at all. It it wasn't there. So what's with being watched? You're saying that this gay fella, not gay, fay, had an eye for Megan, and that's why you were following her after she turned you down. Alton gritted his teeth in frustration. That has nothing to do with it, and I wasn't following her. I saw the Gankanach and wanted to help. That's all. Xavier shook his head and stood, if you say so. You sound off, you chump. 
and learn some. Alton followed his former confidant to the waste bin. He should have known better than to expect Xavier to believe him. Alton looked at the hammer dryad, now watching him with wide green eyes and slender leaf lashes. I am not mental. We'll see who's mental the next time Pitch catches you so much as looking cross-eyed at Megan. Tell him about your fairies, see what happens. Come on, let's get to class. Much later, under the righteous cover of darkness, Alton returned to the commons and hammered an iron spike between the hammer dryad's eyes, pounding the metal flush with the soft inner bark. It groaned and shuddered, sticky sap oozing from the wound. Smiling, shivering, he sat at the nearest table and listened with eyes closed until the screams died away. Alton kept to his own company after that, and welcomed the white-collar freedom of an interpreter position after graduation. Work was plentiful, allowing for numerous opportunities to travel and other benefits sublime. One Tokyo summer was a celebration of contract negotiations, finessed in a sushi bar over Katsuo offered omakase, and the subtle differences in the deaths of Kami and Kamui. In Mexico City, he watched the half-lit autumn streets with his shirt inside out to confound the Chinequas. Their blood splattered the whitewashed walls like currant jelly. Alton furnished his leased one-bedroom flat on Manhattan's Upper West Side with simple lines and filled the bookshelves with Keats, Shakespeare, Service and Trumbull, hearing his mother's disapproving whisper with every selection. New York City was no London, but it did have its own charms. And Fay. During the workday at the office, Alton ignored the brownies in the storage cupboards when others were about, he choked them to death when no one was in sight, hiding the messy tissues in the waste paper basket after he cleaned up. On the nights when the weather was reasonably fair, Alton donned a light jacket, pocketed an umbrella, and hunted proper. To do the deed, he usually carried a stubby iron dagger that relied more on force than an edge to penetrate, a pair of needle-nosed pliers, and a bundle of plastic sandwich bags. He was never happier than when he found what he sought, a pleasure reminiscent of a quilt tucked under the chin. He cut out the eyes of what he was certain was a mazakine on the Lower East Side. He never discovered why it was alone in Riverside Park. The memory of how it flowed and heaved lingered in his palms for months. While waiting for a cab one evening, Alton realized the iridescent ripple in the direction of the reservoir was not a trick of the rain, but a Nagasania slithering back to its watery home. The next night, Alton lured the dreadful thing to the surface of the water with a bottle of wine and the smoke of a clove cigarette. The snake woman savored the wine, breathed the essence of cloves, and barely made a sound as Alton skinned it alive. He rolled the tender ribbons of the remains into the black water for the honest bottom feeders. The skin he took home as a trophy, rolling and unrolling it with a slow hand in bed for many nights afterwards. He was not completely blind to the discarded gristle of the human condition during those sojourns. He would have preferred to avoid people altogether, but cities defied reason, and people were often inconvenient. He was forced to take a brick to a drunk, who refused to surrender a bottle of Thunderbird with a gleefully pickled cuckolane within. The affair left him queasy for days. The unfortunate events with the little packy girl and the Amun living in her pink sneakers left his bowels in nervous misery and kept him home from work for a week. He heard the girl's mother calling her name and the uneven clunk thump of something running away in stone shoes in his sleep. What is the nature of God when innocents are made to suffer and die? He carefully scribed one cold December evening, while the desperation of someone's daughter and a bloody two-by-four bruised his memory. Perhaps evil is nothing more than a collection of blind men blaming the fellow next to them every time they lift a cheek on the pew. He lay shivering in bed all the next day, his hands filled with brittle leaves and chicken bones a pile of messy tissues beside the empty electric kettle. Watery sunlight sliding between the drawn bedroom curtains hurt his eyes. The voice was gruff with a distinct Brooklyn twang. What? You're not happy jerking off like the rest of the kooks? Alton whirled around, knife in hand. 
The elder mother creaked and moaned piteously at his back. The headlamp around the brim of his hat clashed with the intruder's torch, birthing strange shadows in the cold March rain. Pardon? It was the first thing that came to mind, a brittle, mumbled word. The other took a step back, resting a free hand on a bulge at its waist beneath a red poncho. How about you drop the knife and bring those hands up, okay? That's when Alton recognised the dark uniform under the red and the brim of the patrolman's hat. This was a bad time to be interrupted. He probably looked quite the sight, soaked to the bone and covered in splinters and sap. Oh, uh, you you startled me, officer. I, I didn't hear. Yeah, I noticed. I said drop the knife. No, no. Um, let me explain. Just for a moment. This isn't... The beat cop took a step to the left. He reached a hand under his poncho. I ain't going to tell you again. Drop the knife! The words drummed in Alton's head in time with his pulse. The world swelled, distorted, the officer a twisted giant looming over him in the night. Alton tightened his grip on the sticky knife handle. He raised both hands to shield his eyes from the golden lance of the flashlight's beam, the headache raging behind his eyes. You don't have to take that tone with me. This is no ordinary tree. I, the elder mother groaned, leaves rustled and whispered overhead as a branch drooped low. The officer pulled his nightstick and Alton lunged forward. He struck high and sure, burying his knife in a meaty tree limb that sagged under the impact. A too human scream gouged a jagged hole in Alton's thoughts. Red flowed slick and wet in the headlamp's light, poured over his hands, turned to rubies that collected in his galoshes. The red face swung at him, reaching for the signal horn on its shoulder. Afraid of what might answer the call, Alton brought the knife up and down with sharp insistence, over and over until the red fairy slid off the blade to the cold, wet ground. The policeman gurgled at his feet, red bubbling up from the jagged hole in his throat. And then Alton's legs were running, taking him along. He had to get away, far away, a fire built in his belly, cramping, twisting, until he was hunched over and sobbing as he ran away, far away. Run! Run, Alton! Run! He couldn't escape. The noise, the colours, the blinding pain, falling over a curb, suicidal raindrops cold against his face, the red hand of God flashing on a yellow post, commanding him to stop. Fumbling with the metallic clatter of his keys in the lock, icy porcelain against fevered cheeks, knobby fingers pinching his bum, the world swelled, a pustule of rage lodged between his shoulder blades. For days, Alton huddled beneath a pile of blankets, sweating through the pain, screaming when there was nothing else he could do. Mama! Mama, I'm sick! Mama! She didn't answer. Day in. Day out. Faye danced widdershins around the bed, laughing, pointing, red-capped teeth slick with blood on a blade. What had he done to deserve this? He, he hadn't meant to kill, but it was only a man. Another innocent in the war. Unfortunate. Unavoidable. Stop laughing at me! It's not my fault! Mama, make them stop! She still didn't answer. Somewhen, he knocked the phone off the hook when the ringing became too much to bear. The monotone operator was his only friend until she left without saying goodbye. They all left without saying goodbye. Aunt Bethany, Mama, Mama, Megan, bitches, all of them. No one loved him, understood him. He cursed Mama in the kitchen, cried when Mama didn't give him an extra biscuit with tea, cursed Megan when she turned and found him at her window. Why didn't she believe him? Help me! White hot pokers thrust through the meat of his legs and hat pins jabbed behind his knees. He drew his legs tight against his body, screaming without sound, trying to think beyond the threshold of pain that tumbled into loneliness and oblivion. Alton screamed again, and this time managed a grunt, phlegmy and shallow, but a sound. Sound, yeah. Yeah, sound, sound was good. Pain was pain everywhere and all over, from his teeth to his bum to his toes, but sound meant he was alive. Sound could not penetrate the dark of his own making. Alton opened his eyes. 
The world was a blur of grey and black, lit by a feeble light somewhere overhead. He struggled to stand and bumped his head on a low beam that hadn't been there when he lay down. A fairy trick, he was certain. Going forward on hands and pincer knees, Alton crawled through medicine ball-sized wads of paper and massive plastic buckets until he passed under a thick curtain into a larger space, a cave, a hall. His eyes were weak and his swollen fingers lacked sensation that was not pain. He hobbled in shadows, twisted with loathing, calling out, I'll find you! You can't hide forever, you wretched imps! All that came out were grunts and gibbered howls. Alton staggered around the cavernous expanse, tumbling over stacks of this, piles of that. When it became too bright and his eyes swelled with miserable tears, he staggered back to the cubbyhole, dragged himself back inside, covering his shivering form with a plastic tarp like a degenerate on the street. I hate you. I hate you. And every time he returned to his cubbyhole after that, the words became his anchor as he cried himself to sleep. I... Hate you. He needed to find the red fairy who did this to him, cut it, skin it, crush it, hide the tissues, as Alton shambled around the larger chamber in search of an exit back to the world he knew. A spear of yellow light from the cliff above his cubbyhole struck him full in the face like the fires of heaven. Cursing and snarling, he tottered over to the curtain, pulled himself up as far as he could. Surprise turned to anger when he realized something fleshy held the light and kept moving it out of reach. Alton pinched the massive beast as hard as he could until the light fell away with a clatter and comforting dark returned once more. From outside the chamber came the thunder of giant feet taking massive steps. Alton dropped down the side of the cliff, squirmed into his cubbyhole, putting his back to the far wall and covering himself with the tarp. The steps came nearer, and a sheet of light crossed over the curtain, but did not penetrate. The ceiling creaked as whatever lurked at the top of the cliff shifted. Voices rumbled, low and threatening. Blind men mumbling prayers, lifting cheeks on the pew. Alton listened, and fingered the bits of hate rattling about in his stone shoes. Now that is a wild story. That one is super weird. And what really struck me about this story is that we have a protagonist who, in my reading, is really externalizing his violent impulses. And he's externalizing them in something that most people consider completely harmless, which is to say fairy tales. Well, I think it's an interesting combination for this outward look on fairy tales, uh, where I think in a lot of our Western culture, we think of fairy tales as pretty harmless and... Uh, kind of nondescript in a lot of ways. They're just little allegories to tell to children that kind of teach them something or maybe just entertain them for a bit. But I thought it was really interesting that the protagonist is British and there's a lot of Britishisms in the story that I'm sure you all heard. And in uh, the UK, in parts of Europe, the notion of fairies and fae and all of those kind of um, forgotten mythologies have a sinister bent to them. So I think in one reading of it, it is, you know, a harmless fairy tale outlook on life uh, through this uh, very violent story. But there's also a sense that within the culture within which the short story is set, that there is a kind of uh, underlying darkness to them, like a secret history that is much more unbecoming than we would like to acknowledge. That's right. He's pulling these fairy tales out of folklore and into a modern context, which I think in his view is perhaps part of the problem, perhaps part of the reason that nobody believes him, why he feels so alone in his belief and like nobody else knows that they're there. Nobody else knows about these things. He's mocked for them and stuff like that. So um, beginning in Britain and then later when he moves into New York, it's a completely different context for these things to exist. And so there's that counterbalance. 
There was actually several points in this short story that I was reminded of Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy films because they associate with flora and fauna and all of these things that are either benevolent creatures or actually very sick, twisted little things. And del Toro himself likes to play with monsters and expectations. And I felt that this story had that same kind of vein, but this one was so much darker. And because you're kind of getting it from the perspective of the main character, you don't actually understand very much except that these things are there and they must be torn to shreds. Right. That's so funny that you bring that up because the story reminded me a lot of Pan's Labyrinth in a way where we've got a protagonist who is a little girl who dabbles in the world of fauns and fairies, but her actions in the film have these real life consequences that make you question if her fantasy world is any less real than reality because it's just so real in its consequences. It also got me thinking about, I had done some research on whether or not fairy tales are good for children recently. I was actually writing about Santa Claus and different schools of thought arrive at varying results but the consensus seems to be that fairy tales can boost imagination and literacy Um, if a child is especially inspired by them they can provide morality lessons sometimes, they can inspire critical thought but as we grow up we develop the ability to discern between fantasy and reality but We maintain the ability to suspend disbelief in order to enjoy fiction, which just about all adults do. And it also got me thinking about religion a bit. And while I'm not personally a person of faith, I I do respect the fact that it serves a function in society and it brings communities together with a moral code and it proposes a mythology that helps explain the mysteries of existence. Like That's basically what religion is. It's a philosophy with a dash of fairy tale that meets up weekly. So whether faith in fairy tales is a good thing or a bad thing largely depends on how far people take it and how much of their own agency they're willing to give over to it. So what we have here in For Fear of Little Men is a child who not only failed to develop the ability to ascertain between fantasy and reality, they've also come to interpret these imaginary beings as hostile. And I, I did a little bit of research. There was there was mythological beings that I didn't recognize. A kobold was totally new to me. But I, I looked that up, and uh, according to Germanic mythology, these are tiny people who can inhabit your home or mines or ships. And they're not they're tricksters, but they're not inherently malevolent. Like, if anything, there's an idea that if you treat them well, they will bestow blessings upon your household. So it, it's so interesting how our protagonist in this story has just there's something to be destroyed and something to be dismantled very violently. And that's not inherent in the mythology. That's something that's imposed on it. So when I think of this story and I think of religion, it's just, it's nothing that's inherently good or bad. It's what you do about it that makes it good or evil. And I think the title is a really interesting one because I think the protagonist uh, means it or thinks about that kind of title as the things he is destroying, whereas for me, the reader, I interpreted it as he was a little man and he was to be feared, especially as he gets into the New York portion of the story and he kind of offhandedly mentions all these murders that have to happen at the behest of his missions that mm-hmm, he has. Mm-hmm. So he's doing God's work, only it's not in service to God, it's yeah. in service to humanity, I guess. Yeah, and even if you you know kind of take the notion that uh, the fairy and fauna around him are real, um, I, I never kind of fully understood that they were threats. No. No, they never really did anything that bad other than give him a pinch in the bum. And I think the um, kind of notion to take away that I certainly took away from this story was that uh, the things that are harmless, the things that we glom onto, just as Andrea was mentioning, uh, through our childhood, they can be the things that we are forced to reckon with uh, mm-hmm. throughout our adulthood in good ways and bad ways. Um, I know for Andrea and I, that's horror films. And, you know, we love horror films and we want to talk about them and create dialogues about them. But through the online community, there are people who will rip you to shreds, try to dock you try to do all these things because you had a differing opinion or you had a seemingly progressive opinion to theirs. Mm -hmm. And there's this kind of toxic masculinity that pervades these communities. And I think um, even though we're talking about fairies and mythological little beings uh, throughout this story, there is a kind of sense of geek culture that has seeped into this story for Mm -hmm. me. And what's really terrifying about this story is that there's no remorse to be had. There's no responsibility or reasoning, just confusion for, of this protagonist that the rewards he's been promised aren't coming and are never going to come. Now, what did you make of the ending? 
because his narrative kind of becomes increasingly unraveled as we get to the end of the story where we're not really sure where he is. His perspective is so unreliable. For me, that was this character's break with reality. Mm. He was obviously going through something, and I think um, the ending of the story for me confirms that the fairies and things around him uh, were not actually real, and that this is much more symptomatic of a mental illness. I interpreted uh, the beams of light that would hit him. I assumed he was in prison, or some kind of like dark enclosure of some sort, where every so often he's checked upon and drives him mad. Yeah, I, you know, even you know the beams of light, or maybe those reminiscence of reality that stay with him. But yeah, I think there's a definite disassociation that happens by the end of this story, which is quite odd and and very uh, distancing from it as much as you've been kind of uh, let into this world. It's, you know, there is a point where it stops. Right. And as always, it is a wonderful tale in that it inspires dialogue like this. All of Pseudopod stories have uh, varying interpretations, and it's part of the Faculty of Horror's mandate to give different interpretations and different perspectives on these stories. So there's really no wrong answer, but we certainly hope you enjoyed this story as much as we did. We're thrilled to be back at Artemis Rising, and we know that there's a whole bunch of great programming coming out of Pseudopod, and we hope you're digging it. So be sure that you are rating, subscribing, doing all that good stuff for Pseudopod. And if you like what you heard today from us, be sure to check us out at facultyofhorror.com. So be sure to tune in to next episode, because if anything, Pseudopod knows where the monsters are. It stopped in the middle of the cabin's sparsely furnished main room, and straightened until its spines brushed the roof. I hope I didn't come at a bad time. Not at all. I don't get many saguaros stopping by. Fans of short fiction, we want to tell you about the upcoming collection, Godfall and Other Stories by Sandra M. O'Dell. The collection features 23 stories, including four original to this collection, all that amble along the edge of dark places that border horror, fantasy, and the psyche. The review from Publishers Weekly said that this powerful second collection marks Sandra as a writer to watch. They particularly loved Ink, which originally ran on Podcastle. His tattoos shifted under his skin, expectant. One ink slid over his right kidney to the top of his right thigh. The quadricep muscle spasmed, and he dug his knuckle into the tee shot sight until the tattoos settled their differences and the muscle relaxed. Crowded real estate down there and damn tender when ink fought ink for display space. A poster on the far wall of the crowded cafeteria chamber shows an identical man and woman in coveralls and happy smiles with their hands on the woman's pregnant belly. The caption at the bottom reads, A reproductive worker is a happy worker. Med call to schedule your next sex time today. No, life under a porch was not for me. The local bridges were all taken, all except for the comfy stone bridge south of the city proper with the not-so-comfy ghosts. I heard tell of a greybeard who lived under a city bridge and was maybe looking for something less busier, so I went to see what we could work out. Well, he worked me out all righty, right out from under his bridge with a roar and a tumble. Him and his silver coins woven into his back air so's the trollops might find him fancy. Fah. Three of the samples here are from stories included in this collection while others give you a taste of Sandra's range and style. And there's more on Escape Artists that I couldn't fit into this audio spot. The title story, Godfall, is intensely weird and I delighted in the apocalypse cult at the edge of the screen. This story lives in the same neighborhood as Ligotti's The Last Feast of Harlequin, as well as Laird Barron's Old Leech Cycle. The worms crawl in. The worms crawl out, diseased, and hope a pox on our souls. As we kiss, eyes open, she cries my tears. When the end comes, 
there's nothing for it but to hold tight to one another and pretend, for the barest moment, there are only two of us in bed. As if stepping into a pool of India ink, the darkness seeped through his sweatpants, up his right leg and then his left, swallowing him whole. The nail's chest tightened at the sight. His breath came in short, shallow gasps. He was nothing more than the play of shadows over the folds and the material, and he had no reason to be afraid. But fear needed no reason, and the darkness crept up his legs, cold and insistent. The collection will be available in trade paperback and available through your favorite online retailers. A limited edition hardcover will be available exclusively through Hydra House. This is available in April 2018. Pre-order your copy of Godfall and Other Stories now. Music is We Are Saved by Vortex. If Dwanda can get the airlock open, she can get outside before anyone can stop her. Give Dad a hug. Say goodbye. It can't be any colder than she feels deep inside. 